Just hear me pretty good there? Perfect. It's always the stragglers coming here at the last minute. I got to start saying it starts at 625. <laughs> and nobody wants to sit in the front row. Isn't that a classic? Yeah, all right. All right, well, thanks for coming, you guys. We're going to get started. Hope you guys had a good dinner because uh, you're going to need your brain food, your, your blood sugar. Um, how many of you guys have been to other events here? How many repeat customers are we talking here? Well, that's good. Great. Nice to see some of you from the rally today. That was uh, a nice day and a fun event. Um, tonight, we're going to talk about what the Great Reset is. Now, chances are I've got an educated crowd as it is. So really what this is for, we're live streaming this, it's also on our uh, YouTube channel, so that if you have any people that you, in your life that are on the brink of waking up that you think might like this information or use, find this information useful, that's kind of who it's for. Now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be foregoing, what did I do there? Uh oh. Can you still hear me? Just fine? Perfect. Okay. What I'm going to be talking about tonight, and we're going to have a question and answer period at the end. I'm going to not talk a whole lot about individual people, uh, names like Klaus Schwab, George Soros, etc. As important as they are in players in this whole thing, they're interchangeable. They're not necessary for what's going on. What I'm going to do is uh, zone in on three things that are happening, regardless of who's the front man, Okay. And these are things that you can start, once you start understanding the mechanics of what's going on, you start to, s to notice when they're advertising one thing, you start to smell what they're cooking sort of behind the scene. You can tell what's a smoke screen, and you can tell what's really the real play, if that makes any sense. Should make sense by the end of the night. So I'm going to spend two minutes rehashing our first, we did a whole series on, a whole session, the first session on the history of the Western civilization what it is, why it's unique, why it was so successful. Now, throughout history, the majority of government structures were rex lex. Rex for king, lex for law. So a king wakes up, decides he's grumpy, he can say, off with your head, and it becomes law. It becomes legal, right? King opens his mouth, and magically what comes out is law. And that wasn't just for the olden days of the crazy, grumpy monarchs. Uh, in the last century, we had men with more centralized power than any king had ever had, even though they weren't called monarchs. In fact, Stalin and Lenin replaced the czars, and in place of the czars, they put in hundreds of czars in the forms of all-powerful bureaucrats. And one czar was bad enough when the communist system t came to t town in Russia, things got even worse. Turns out a hundred czars are worse than one, and so on and so forth. So in the Western world, now the next diagram in 30 seconds, I should be able to get through to you the major difference between a political theory based on atheism versus theism. Now here's an eat, a, a leaf cutter ant colony, and that's to scale. So the actual mound that they build their tunnels through at the surface is about almost as tall as a man. And these subterranean structures they create, those little bubbles there are fungal farms, and they're about the size of a football, and the waste deposits there are about the size of a sleeping bag. Which one of the ants understands how this colony works? Not a single one. In fact, you could get the top ant experts on Earth together, and in three years or war, whatever, they, they had three years to create a synthetic ant farm based on their understanding of the process, and it would also fail. So if humans are not smart enough to run an ant colony, how much less capable are they to run a human civilization? So the Western world was based on the idea that civilization, like an ant colony, is actually designed from above. 
God the Creator, a perfectly ordered, structured mind, has put into nature rules and regulations that work beyond the ability of those in the system to even understand, predict, or control. And the West, therefore, created the, a revolution in government called Lex being Rex. The law was king. There was no king. And not just any old laws, okay? When I realized that a uh, chemical company has cracked the code and makes an effective medicine, I automatically know that they have cracked the code of real laws in real nature to have a real positive impact in medicine. The reason our civilization is so successful is because our founders cracked the code, so to speak, of the natural laws of civilization. Laws that were put in there by God, naturally occurring, as much as chemistry's laws are naturally occurring. So things like private property, free market, freedom of expression and choice, etc., were seen as natural laws that make civilizations play themselves out the way an ant colony would play itself out. Imagine if you created a class, in the, in the classification of ants, you've got worker ants, which are subdivided according to their tasks, uh, soldier ants, egg-laying ants, etc. There's no political ant, and that, does, that, that is to the benefit of the ant colony. If you created an all-powerful political ant in the ant colony, it would destroy that colony. It turns out the same thing happens in human civilization. Now, the original pandemic was the, in the garden where men began to think of the idea, we can be as God. When you, God can exist, but if you act as if he doesn't, you have formed a, the, an atheistic political theory is what comes down the pipes. Now, remember, in an atheistic realm, they view the universe and the world as an unpurposeful, undesigned, chaotic system. The closest thing to order and structure is the human mind. So now the elite hive mind of political elites has to come in and take God's job. Somebody must put order over chaos. Theistic political theory says, no, this world, like chemistry and physics and you know, molecular physics, is actually perfectly structured and runs great. The actual only source of chaos in this universe is the human mind and heart because of sin. So we see that as something that needs to be tamed. The, athe the atheistic political theorists see that as God itself, the human mind. Do you see the radically black and white different 180 scenario that would play out? That's two polar opposite views of civilization. Now what are some of the attributes God has that man must now have if he is to play God? Omnipresence. God is omnipresent, so something Man's desire will be to be omnipresent. Now we're entering into a, an era now with, through technology, AI, etc. We're beginning to, for the first time in history, approach something like omnipresence. Omniscience, same kind of thing. You're present and aware of what's going on. Anything playing God will desire to have these attributes. And obviously whatever is playing God has to be the highest authority. And that's why it brings us back to Rex Lex. A society that is built on atheistic political theory will, with, whether it knows it or not, wind itself over back to Rex makes Lex. Everybody follow me so far? All right. I'll take your word on it. Now, whether you're a Christian or not, uh, fact of the matter is the most influential person in history and the one on whose teaching much of the West is based on, and then the, the central character in the most published and studied book in history is a man called Jesus of Nazareth. Now, he seemed to pin everything down on a dichotomy. He said, you will either serve the living God or mammon, which was the Babylonian god for money. You will either serve God or money. That's it. And I used to think that was a naive way to look at life. As I go forward, as I get older and hopefully wiser, I realize the reason that is a truth is that any money who is not God but wants to be God, the only way to achieve omnipotence in the human realm is money. So when you have kicked God out of his job and you're, willing to, you're desiring to take his job, you will require loads and loads of money. 
So there are two ways to live life, essentially. There's the righteous, morally driven, value-filled, loving lives of true servitude, or a black hole in each human heart seeking to devour all. Because when you remove God, and an irreplaceable void exists in the human soul. Money represents the desire to own, control, and consume. It is as close to Godhood as anybody can get. But man turns out to be somewhat of an uncaring God that uses money for his omnipotence. Now, who here has seen the movie Network in 1976? Right? And there's a brilliant scene that I'm about to show you. Now, if you don't know about this movie, there's a news anchor, and he's about to get fired. But then he starts ranting about the corruption in government and, and corporations and etc. And all long, lo and behold, he becomes the most popular talk show host in the country, like massively popular. So the corporate news network says, well, let's ride this pony. This is, this is ratings. Unfortunately, he gets a little too truthful, and that starts to uh, shake up the corporation that owns the news network that he's working for. So there's a problem here. There's a dilemma. They're making money off of him, but now he's starting to meddle in business deals that affects them because everyone's listening to him. So they sit him down, and at this point he's gone a little crazy, and the CEO of the corporation that owns the news network is going to try and get something across to him. He's going to try to get across to him that the world is run and owned by money. Just a couple minute clip here. You have meddled with the primal forces of nature, Mr. Beale, and I won't have it. Is that clear? You think you've merely stopped a business deal. That is not the case. The Arabs have taken billions of dollars out of this country, and now they must put it back. It is ebb and flow, tidal gravity. It is ecological balance. You are an old man who thinks in terms of nations and peoples. There are no nations. There are no peoples. There are no Russians. There are no Arabs. There are no third worlds. There is no West. There is only one holistic system of systems. One vast and emane, interwoven, interacting, multivariate, multinational dominion of dollars. Petrodollars, electrodollars, multi-dollars, Reich marks, rims, rubles, pounds, and shekels. It is the international system of currency which determines the totality of life on this planet. That is the natural order of things today. That is the atomic and subatomic and galactic structure of things today. And you have meddled with the primal forces of nature. And you will atone. Am I getting through to you, Mr. Beale? You get up on your little 21 inch screen and how about America and democracy there is no America there is no democracy there is only IBM and ITT and AT&T and DuPont Dow Union Carbide and Exxon those are the nations of the what do you think the Russians talk about in their councils of state, Karl Marx? They get out their linear programming charts, statistical decision theories, min and max solutions, and compute the price cost probabilities of their transactions and investments, just like we do. We no longer live in a world of nations and ideologies, Mr. Beale. The world is a college of corporations, inexorably determined by the immutable bylaws of business. The world is a business, Mr. Beale. And our children will live, Mr. Beale, to see that perfect world in which 
There's no war or famine, oppression or brutality. One vast and ecumenical holiness for whom all men will work to serve a common profit in which all men will hold a share of stock. All necessities provided chosen you, Mr. Beale, to preach this evangel. Why me? Because you're on television, dummy. 60 million people watch you every night of the week, Monday through Friday. I have seen the face of God. You just might be right, Mr. Beale. A lot of profound truths in that clip, by the way. Um, the corporate class, how many of you guys, how many do you think politicians depend on our minimal contributions for re-election? Where do you think the millions of dollars roll in for their campaign re-election campaigns? Corporations. Corporations own the largest media outlets. There's a symbiotic hole right there. Neither one can attack the other. And another very important thing you'll see over and over again in these elite corporate and political circles is they actually have a desire to create a heaven on earth, like he just described. Every anxiety tranquilized, every boredom amused, etc. That's the business of a god, to quell the effects of sin. When you go up and take that position as, as humanity, you must deal with human sin. And they, the corporate and elite political elites actually believe they can deliver a utopia. Now, what is money? Money is essentially congealed labor. You do work, you get a, pound, a unit of currency for it. Why create currency? Well, because it solves what's called the double coincidence of wants. So in the bartering systems before currency existed, the lady with the banana is happy to exchange it for a stack of books because that's what she happens to want. And guess what? Double coincidence, he wants bananas. But what happens if she wants the toaster oven in the background but the guy with the toaster oven wants the turkey. The guy with the turkey wants the books. Now you have a problem, which is very common. Currency solved that problem, okay? Now, throughout history, and we'll look at the last 500 years of reserve currency, someone's currency on planet Earth has served as the reserve currency, the most trusted currency on, pl on the planet. In the 14 and 1500s, it was the Portuguese real which was a, and back in those days, coins were minted out of precious metals, copper, silver, gold, or a mixture of them. The harder it is and more expensive it is to make a currency, the harder that currency is. And I can illustrate that simply. Let's say I create something called the Emanuel dollar. And all you need to do for an Emanuel dollar is get a blank sheet of paper, write $100 on there, rip it up, and give it to me. Now let's say... Uh, Steve had some really fancy shoes that I wanted, and it turned out um, that Mike wanted the same shoes as well. So we're both competing for your footwear. I start writing down $100. He comes, he writes, I'll, I'll make two of them. Now he's made, they're easy to make, the currency is easy to make, so now we sit there all night long making them more and more and more. Eventually we'll get tired of it and it won't be worth the labor, but your shoes will probably be worth $60,000 in annual dollars by the time we're done but they're not worth that in real currency. So the harder a currency and more expensive it is, the harder it is. Um, Spain took over after they invaded Portugal. The pieces of eight coins came in. The Dutch guilder was next, the French franc, and then the British pound, and eventually up in, from 1920s onwards, it's been the US dollar. Now notice that about every 100 years, the reserve currency changes hands. Something happens to either devalue a currency or make another one more uh, valuable. Uh, after World War II, the US had two-thirds of the world's gold. They possessed two-thirds of the world's gold, and the US GDP accounted for 50% of all ec economic activity on Earth. So it was obvious that it was to be the next reserve currency. 
They met in New Hampshire in Bretton Woods in 1944. Forty countries met there, and they decided together what they were trying to do is create a one-world currency. But what they ended up settling on is the U.S. dollar. And the U.S. dollar was going to be backed by gold. That means every U.S. dollar represents a certain amount of gold that was at Fort Knox physically. It was a gold-backed currency. At this Bretton Woods meeting, they also created the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, centralized banks, the goal of which was to make sure that underdeveloped countries could get some help. They were like a socialist banking system, transferring money from wealthy countries to the lesser wealthy countries. Now, one of the reasons they wanted to do a reserve one world coin, which they never achieved at that time, they just settled in the U.S. dollar, is countries will constantly devalue their currency on purpose. Why would somebody want to do that? Let's say you're behind the United States in production. You print too much of your money, it devalues your currency. Now, your goods are cheaper on the world market than American goods. So everyone starts buying your stuff. Plus, corporations inside your own country now have less buying power because their currency is worth less. So instead of buying exports from outside your country, they start buying from your internal factories. So the devaluing of your own currency can be used to your advantage to bump up your economy. But when countries are constantly doing that, it destabilizes world interchange. Does that make sense? So the attempt to create a singular world currency was based on the desire to stabilize international exchange. Um, unfortunately, from 1944 to 1971, the U.S. began to print more dollars than they had gold in the bank. That becomes a problem because now effectively it's no longer gold-backed currency. And finally it got so out of hand that Nixon in 71 just says, you know what, we're not gold-backed anymore. We're literally just paper money, like Emmanuel dollars. Now, what do you think happens to the value of a dollar when it's based on nothing, right? It's a matter of time before we realize the emperor has no clothes. Now, here's a map showing the U.S. dollar's worth. Uh, this is 2020 right here. Whoops, whoops. Here is a, a dollar in 2020 was worth, in 1913, 26 times more. And to put it in more, and here's the time in which went off the gold, the gold standard. It plummeted even faster after that, never recovered. Um, and during this entire time, by the way, the reason for the devaluation is they were printing more money than they had gold. But it really sped up, obviously, once they didn't even pretend. Now here's a chart showing that a dollar in 2020 gets you a cup of McDonald's coffee. That dollar, let's say in... 1933 could get you 10 bottles of beer. Uh, in 1913, we get you 30 Hershey's chocolate bars. So the what a dollar can do for you has diminished because it's, it's based on nothing and it's printed endlessly. And in a way to look at it, who does not suffer from inflation like this? If, you, if you're a working class person, you have, let's say, $15,000 just stashed away in your savings. That's past labor frozen into a unit of currency sitting down like, you know, savings. But over time, inflation makes it worth less. It's almost as if you're being taxed in the past, if that makes any sense. Uh, but if you buy real estate with money, let's say you have real estate money instead of just savings money. So the rich don't leave money liquid. They buy companies, they buy real estate, they buy hard assets that rise up as inflation rises up. So it inflation proofs their money. So they couldn't care less. Plus, their assets are worth more than their, if I owe $100,000 and I owe that in money, and then inflation kicks in and I have hard assets that all of a sudden become worth way more, now it's easier for, for me to pay off my debts because my hard assets can be liquefied and into larger things, larger amounts of money than I had before, just from inflation. So if money was hard backed, what you would see is that a person who saved $10,000 10 years ago, that money would be like a little piece of real estate. It would be worth more in the future. It'd be like making money without having to work. Does that make sense? It would act like a piece of real estate. 
why can't, why do they keep printing all that money? Why can't they just stop printing the money and stay gold backed? Hmm? What, what I, that's a very nice question. Obviously, greed. Politicians sit in their office and they're visited by multiple corporations in the form of lobbying firms. The lobbying firms give them money in order to get their benefit when it comes, let's say you own a cement pouring company, a large one, and you want an infrastructure contract in the US, a statewide, like worth millions and millions and even billions of dollars. What's one way to get the contract given to your company versus your competitor? You lobby a politician who is in charge of that project. You pay them to select you. So there's this kickback money scheme. Lobbying is the number one business of Washington, D.C. and Ottawa. You're seeing p money buying power with money to make more money. So this, runaway, this becomes a runaway process in which every politician wants in on this game and they start spending and promising contracts that they have no money to, to fund. What's the solution, at least short term? Print more money. So there's an incentive to not balance the budget. Um, here's the, in billions of dollars, foreign aid given, throughout the US, given by the US every single year. It's close to $50 billion nowadays. Now why would a politician want to give, I don't know, a Uganda government branch a billion dollars, I don't know, out of the fondness of their heart? I mean, why don't they spend the money here to buy votes, to buy favors from voters? Well, the reality is, and we found this out, do you guys ever, ever guys remember hearing about the Panama Papers a few years ago? And about three years ago in 2019, there was the Pandora Papers. And about 11 million files were leaked, and it was published by the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, the ICIJ, showing that there was about, they tracked 334 politicians worldwide over about a 10 year period and they found all their offshore bank account holdings. So when your country gives money to another country, it leaves your country's borders and therefore your country's ability to track the money. It enters a strange dark ether before it lands somewhere else where people line their pockets. Now what's interesting is according to the Pandora Papers, um, 38, the, the country that has the most politicians on the list of offshore, offshore tax evading bank accounts was the Ukraine at 38. Why is that interesting? Every major, most major US politicians have either an associate or a family member employed by either a political party or a corporation in the Ukraine. The Ukrainian political class has welcomed the world's top level politicians, including Americans, to come to the Ukraine to money launder, essentially. Could it be, and I don't present opinions here, just facts, that the reason that the West really doesn't want the Ukraine falling under the, the control of the Russians is that they have a quite a nice little money scheme going on right now. I don't know, money does motivate, right? Money printing. Uh, it allows you to avoid a balanced budget, which means you can promise anything to everybody and off the game goes. Causes inflations, we just talked about that, your savings are worth less. What's the end game to something like this? Well, anybody here to the country of Venezuela? The country that had the largest oil reserves, offshore oil reserves on planet Earth, still does. The socialist system that brought in um, destroyed the economy. Uh, two years ago, I looked it up. To get a cup of coffee in Venezuela cost you one billion bolivars, okay? Uh, I think in the last five years, 14% of the country has literally, because they can't afford to drive, walked out of the country by, on foot. This is the end game to mo endless money printing from bad fiscal policy. Do you think our governments know this? Of course they do. So why are they doing it? Do they have a reserve plan in, in, the, in, the, in the wings, right? Of course they do. Uh, another factor that I think is interesting is what's happened in the last generation, most kids do what after high school? They go to university. It's almost an extension of high school now. How, come, how can everybody afford to go to college? Well, government student loans. You just, the government agrees to give the universities a certain amount of money 
it's not directly paid for by the students, so they, they suffer nothing until they have to pay it back. So that inflates over time the cost of an education to the point where this generation's paying, uh, I think something like 20 times more for a college education than my parents did. But everyone's in college, it waters down the value of a college degree, they get out of school, they work minimum wage. They work a job they could have worked without a college degree, but now they owe $60,000. And the house market has driven so past their ability to pay that they are looking at never being able to own a home in many parts of the West. Who is going to be cheering the fall of this monetary crash? And when they're promised a total reset, blank, blank out their debts, start over again. Who's going to be at the forefront cheering for something new? the Zoomers and the Millennials and some of the Gen Xers who have been behind the eight ball doing what they were told to do. Go to school. You'll get a good job. They come out. They're indebted. They can't co the cost of living surpass them. Their system, this system is completely out of their reach. So you've created a two full generations that will be on board with some sort of monetary reset. Um, the road to digital money. Now, the Bank of Canada has, is posting stuff like this. So you know that this is not, this is something, it's called Central Bank Digital Currency, CBDC. They've already been talking about this for over five years. They know the economy is going to crash. Every country in the West is money printing like there is no tomorrow. They know that about every hundred years, the bottom falls out from the current world reserve currency. They already have a ship they're willing to land on. It, it, it is something that to them offers two things. A way out of the system that they are sinking and a system that will give them total control, which is something governments always love. When do governments impose a tax or a regulation over us that they then willingly take away? The income tax was supposed to be temporary. Anybody here still paying income tax? Right? Uh, Here's for, this was just recent. The World Economic, the World Government Summit uh, just went by, and there's a very interesting two-minute clip here I want you guys to hear. For that, uh, I remember talking to an Australian diplomat at one point about this break between the U.S. and China, and said, you know, both sides are going to say, whose team are you on? Mm. And he said, our job is to make sure the question never arises. But the question has arisen. And so I think we have to go deeper. And it's not about the US versus China. It's about what underpins a world order is always the financial system. Mm. I, I was very privileged. My father was an advisor to Nixon when they came off the gold standard in 71. And so I was brought up with a kind of inside view of how very important the financial structure is to absolutely everything else. And what we're seeing in the world today, I think, is we are on the brink of a dramatic change where we are about to, and I'll say this boldly, we're about to abandon the traditional system of money and accounting and introduce a new one. And the new one, the new accounting, is what we call blockchain. It means digital. It means having an almost perfect record of every single transaction that happens in the economy, which will give us far greater clarity over what's going on. It also raises huge dangers in terms of the balance of power between states and citizens. In my opinion, we're going to need a digital constitution of human rights if we're going to have digital money. Uh, but also, this new money will be sovereign in nature. Most people think that digital money is crypto and private. But what I see are superpowers introducing digital currency. The Chinese were the first. The U.S. is on the brink, I think, of moving in the same direction. The Europeans have committed to that as well. And the question is, will that new system of digital money and digital accounting accommodate the competing needs of the citizens of all these locations so that every human being has a chance to have a better life? Because that's the only measure of whether a world order really serves. So a year, if not too long ago, how many people heard government slagging things like cryptocurrency, right? Saying it was absolutely unstable and this and that. And now they're going about to introduce their own. Um, as a matter of fact, cryptocurrency, which is based on a blockchain system, is harder to manipulate. It's, it's impossible to create. It's more hard 
than gold in many ways. You would have to crash the entire system of world computers to get rid of it. So things like Bitcoin are actually quite solid pieces that they just haven't been adopted by enough people yet to form an actual parallel economy. If you think about what currency should be, it should be like any other business. It should be a free market of money. If people start turning to something like crypto out of their own free will, and they rely on it, they're trusting it, which is what we do anyways. The only reason we use the Canadian dollar is we all have agreed to using it. If the system is hard-backed, like a crypto blockchain, it becomes actually a viable parallel economy. Uh, actually, right now, a number of countries are adopting uh, Bitcoin as their reserve currency. Like, countries are starting to get on board. The government knows this is inevitable. The government knows that they are destroying fiat traditional currency. So what they're doing now is they're presenting the McDonald's of crypto, government-run crypto. Although, unlike Bitcoin and other blockchain-based cryptos, it will be fully under the control of the government. Anybody here hear about trucker convoy donators having their bank accounts frozen in the last couple of months? How about that Chilliwack single mom who put $40 towards the truck convoy, and according to the Chilliwack MP, she contacted him, and they froze her bank account. Do you think that's something that could happen down the road if we're misbehaving according to the government? You go and buy a chocolate bar, you go and pay your rent, and let, long and behold, you cannot. Digital currency, centrally controlled, gives the government omnipotence and omniscience. It does. What, do they what goes hand in hand with digital currency? How about a digital ID system? Now, many of us already have iPhones and we use phone, uh, Apple Pay. Anybody here use Apple Pay? Uh, even your debit card tracks you. I mean, they can see where you've been. Cash is the only untraceable economic system. However, if I, I can choose to go on a Apple Pay or off of it. I can choose to use cash or not. I have the freedom of choice currently. If they move to what they're describing, we will have a, you will not be able to buy a bubble gum or go to a garage sale or give a homeless guy anything without being perfectly traced. And perfectly traced means perfectly controlled because they can shut you down for any reason. What are you going to do about it? Right? I, I believe the monetary reset, which is part of the Great Reset, is the one they're not talking about. Because when, when a poker player has got a great hand, do they bring attention to their great hand? No, they keep it dead silent. They play as if they don't have a great hand. The greatest hand that the government has currently to usher in the world they think is a good world and self-interested benefits them is the digital currency slash digital ID system. The money reset is absolutely the number one thing threatening our future, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, the Association of Canadian Banks is talking about this even in 2018. They're basically saying, and they tout its good usefulness. For example, here's a clip from the article. Digital ID is the challenge of answering who are you with a high degree of certainty without resorting to face-to-face -face interaction and the exchange of physical documents. Like that's been a problem, right? It takes out human error is what they're claiming they like about it, but what is it really doing, giving them absolute control? So the money reset is something that is ongoing. We have a chance, by the way, I mean, the two chances out of this would be enough people recognizing this as the play, voting in politicians who will stop this system, stop the endless money printing, etc. But the other off route is a parallel economy of some sort. Personally, I think crypto is a good investment. I think precious metals may not accrue as much value as crypto, but they will hold, they'll anti-inflationary. So if you don't have real estate money, don't keep your money liquid, is my advice. But that's between you and your accountant. Values reset is another big part of the Great Reset. Now, what do I mean by values reset? The Frankfurt School came here in the 40s and 50s, and their goal was very specific. They said they were going to slowly march through the institutions and present a Marxist, cultural Marxist point of view. What they meant by that is they were going to start teaching in schools and eventually they will have taught enough people that those people come out and what do they do? They become lawyers, they become teachers, they become doctors, they become politicians. And eventually the evangelism of Marxism will be complete. 
We've just lived through two full generations of people educated essentially K through university with socialist-based talking points. So now the chickens have come home to roost. The cultural Marxists, when they came here from, from the East, they realized, oh, in Russia it was easy. You had the absolute nobility class and you had the poor peasant class and no real middle class in between. So they pitched it to them via class warfare, poor versus rich. When they came here, it was the post-war economic boom, and the middle class here was thriving. There had never been a middle class in history like the American middle class post-World War II. So they said, we can't really install a class warfare here. It won't take. So they said, well, who are the marginalized people here? The black community, pre-civil rights, and the LGBT community. They were the original targets of discontent by the cultural Marxists in the early days. The Black Panthers were a Marxist-Leninist organization, unabashedly. And until they removed it from their website, BLM had all the Marxist talking points on their website as their main goals. And they even said, that one of the founders had admitted on, on camera, we are trained Marxists. Now they are still being used as a useful pawn in the advancement of this system. The LGBT community. At this point, it would be, I would seem like a Neanderthal if I said to somebody in a lower generation than mine, boomer, uh, sorry, a zoomer or a millennial, that I thought there was norms to sexuality, that I, I think transgenderism uh, isn't the way things are normally should be. I would be seen as hate-filled, as ignorant, and as a knuckle-dragging mouth breather. The value system reset has already taken hold. Again, this is the same crowd that was originally targeted by the Frankfurt School. This is the current flag you'll see flying on during Pride Month, Pride uh, Week. There's Pride Week on top of Pride Month now. It's taken up more and more of our calendar space. And there's a reason for that. They're trying to replace the old values with the new values. And you see this is the same squad being represented. Uh, this is for the transgender community. This is for the BIPOC, b Black Indigenous People of Color, and then the traditional LGBT flag. Still a useful tool for the cultural Marxist revolution. Redefining family, right? At this point, we're well into an era in which the idea that a family is a certain set biological structure has been completely wiped out in the minds of most of the new generation. So this is the value reset. What's the last part of the reset? The elite ruling class reset. Remember earlier I had said that when you remove God from the picture, someone's got to take God's job. That will be the ruling class. And therefore, it'll have to go back away from the revolution of the West, which was Lex is Rex, back to Rex Lex. And the elites have always had a propensity to thinking they know what's best for us. Have you noticed that? The way that they talk. Is there, is there been maybe a record of people having central, central control over entire nations and it's gone horribly wrong? Has there been a recent example of why that system does not work? Well, of course. Uh, I got my slides mixed up. Before we get to that slide, let's see what else, what other bright ideas that they have. We are probably one of the last generations of Homo sapiens, because in the coming generations, we will learn how to engineer bodies and brains and minds. Now, how exactly will the future masters of the planet look like? This will be decided by the people who own the data. Now, why is data so important? It's important because we have reached the point when we can hack not just computers, we can hack human beings and other organisms. Now, what do you need in order to hack a human being? You need two things. You need a lot of computing power, and you need a lot of data, especially biometric data. But control of data might enable human elites to do something even more radical than just build digital dictatorships. By hacking organisms, elites may gain the power to re-engineer the future of life itself. Because once you can hack something, you can usually also engineer it. All of life, for four billion years, dinosaurs, amoebas, tomatoes, humans, all of life was subject to the laws of natural selection, 
and to the laws of organic biochemistry. But this is now about to change. Science is replacing evolution by natural selection with evolution by intelligent design. Not the intelligent design of some god above the clouds, but our intelligent design and the intelligent design of our clouds, the IBM cloud, the Microsoft cloud, these are the new driving forces of evolution. And at the same time, science may enable life after being confined to, for four billion years to the limited realm of organic compounds, science may ena enable life to break out into the inorganic realm. Wait, what could go wrong? What could go wrong? Anybody here seen Black Mirror? The Black Mirror episodes? Is this not a Black Mirror episode waiting to happen? Um, do you see the God urge manifesting just naturally and slowly? Someone's got to take his job. Nature abhors a vacuum. If God's kicked out, something else must take its place. And you hear there, there is a misconception here. If the human being has no soul, if the human being is purely material, that means all your emotions, all what you think is rational consciousness, everything you feel is your free will, if that is ultimately a material system platform on which it runs, a carbon-based system as it is now, why not be able to transfer that to a silicone-based system, a hard drive, which was the premise behind many of the Black Mirror episodes. If human consciousness is purely physical, then it can be transferred from one medium to the other. And can you imagine the kind of nightmares that could be unleashed on us by a group of ruling class people who now control us with our currency to put all sorts of experimentations on us and our children? They think it's a utopia that they're going towards. But let's look at some past utopias pr promised by central planning to others. Anybody heard of Chairman Mao? The, uh, the Great Leap Forward, it was promised to be... Chairman Mao looked across the water to the West and said, look at their industrial superpower. We want to be like that. Now, the West had slowly, organically come into an industrial revolution, one little innovation at a time. And all the businesses and e e commerce had morphed around it. It had happened naturally over a hundred year period. Mao wanted to do it in five years. And it was a good idea. Who doesn't want to join the, 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 top, the top economy in town in just five years? Let's do it. So they organized to take farmers away from their farms, put them in, an in, in overnight factory towns that were sprung up quickly, as quickly as that. And instead of having your own private property and farm, you worked in a communal farm with 20,000 other of your closest friends. Now, obviously, the work incentive, the ineffic inefficiencies, everything piled up on itself and the system collapsed. And instead of a great leap forward, what did China actually get out of this whole deal? The Great Famine, the largest famine ever recorded in human history. Up to about 50 million people died. A common occurrence during this time, by the way, missing children. Why would children go missing during a famine? They're being hunted for food, right? Uh, before the Stalin-Leninist revolution, under the czars, as bad as it was under the Russian czars, Russia, for the entire imperial period from 1721 to 1917, was a net exporter of grain. As much as they were overtaxed and overregulated, they were still running their own farms as private property, private businesses, and they were doing quite well. And then enters Marxism, and you've got bread lines in a country that used to produce too much food. Central planning from a group of elites who think they know best and have great ideas for our future almost always end up in absolute and total disaster. Hell on earth instead of heaven on earth. Um, here's another great insight from our future overlords. And this is actually not a joke. They think that climate change is very serious and therefore we need to get rid of meat ranching or else we're, we're, it's producing too much methane. So instead we're going to eat a bug based diet. Now my question is, how, can you guarantee me that these wonderful central planners like Mao's Great Leap Forward can make enough bugs for us to eat? Because the only thing worse than having to eat bugs is starving to death while eating bugs. Do you agree? And is it possible they don't know what they're doing? Uh, interesting, 
Joe Biden's recently come out and he said, he made a very curious statement. He said, expect food shortages. Very interesting thing to say. What would he know that we don't know? Uh, maybe they're seeing ahead of, ahead of the game all the consequences of the lockdowns. I don't know. Now, a curious, and this is something that is just curious. I, I won't back it 100%. Um, Time Magazine loves the idea too. All these major corporate, corporate news is owned by what? Corporations. Who pays for all the political careers? Corporations. So don't expect them to criticize each other. Six, in the last 18 months, 16, or yeah, 16 major food manufacturing plants have mysteriously gone up in flames throughout the U.S. Uh, most of them this year, and it's not even half over. So my question, and it's not at the regular rate. Obviously, industrial accidents happen, but what's happening is that the largest manufacturing plants in multiple locations throughout the U.S. are just suddenly going up in flames. I don't know. Maybe it is an accident. I don't know. But I think it's, it's curious. It's out of the norm, and it's curious. Just like the number of churches being vandalized throughout the West in the last three years. It's in the hundreds. It's a trend. Uh, and we're almost done here, folks. ESGs. Anybody heard the term ESG? Great, there's some real educated people in this, in this crowd. ESG is the system they want to run the economy in the West. And it stands for environmental goals. The E is environmental goals. So is your business sustainable? Anybody here the Green New Deal, right? The proposed absolute nightmare scenario where they want to retrofit every single building and house in North America with sustainable energy technology. You got the money to pay for that? Who's going to pay for that? Oh, I guess they can just money print, right? What could go wrong? Environmental goals will be forced. Social goals. Do you have a transgender person working in your school board? Do you have a gay pastor working in your church? Do you have a person of color in your administration? Et cetera, so on and so forth. This is going to be pushed from the top down in a social engineering push. And the governance part of it is they want, they are stacking the, the board, the, the, the chair, board of chairmen in more and more banks and large corporations with people who have signed on to this exact same thing. You are also start, starting to see banks get behind the idea and actually putting the idea in practice of not giving loans to someone who is qualified but whose company does not meet their ESG standards. This is our version of the Chinese tr social credit system. And what would make this complete, this system completely enforceable? Would digital currency do it? Absolutely, because then they don't have to wait for you to get a bank loan. They can shut you down just by looking at how your company operates, sending you an email saying, you've got three days to get four black lesbians on your school board, or you guys don't have, don't have a school next month. And, oh, this is curious. Look at this. This is from an investment firm. In the new reality that will follow COVID, sustainability, meaning ESG, will be the mantra, are banks ready? Now why, if ESG is such a urgent, current crisis, why would you have to wait till the COVID era is over to really start implementing it? It's almost as if these are a series of steps they're doing they're to soften us up and transform the landscape. And it's not something that needs to be done. It is a tool that comes in succession. Where does the term Great Reset first ever show its, its, its ugly head? What well, was the title of the World Economic Forum in September of 2020? They called themselves the Great Reset. And what did they discuss at this Great Reset conference? The Great Reset. Re and they put out a, a little infomercial as to what the future would look like under the Great Reset and includes nobody having private property and we all eating bugs. Stuff, wonderful things like that. Uh, Klaus Schwab, right, away, right as the pandemic started, within a month had written a book called COVID-19 and the Great Reset, basically detailing how we could, if we so wanted to, use the Great Reset to implement many of the monetary, value, and uh, ruling class changes that would allow that system to come to fruition. Now, his 2016 book, The Fourth Industrial Revolution, is actually his most nefarious book. This is Klaus Schwab, who is the founder of the World Economic Forum. Now, in it, he describes that we've lived through three basic industrial revolutions, the steam engine and mass agriculture, then electrical and gas-powered industry, and then the 
uh, computerized technology in a revolution in the 80s and 90s and 70s. Now we're in a place, they're calling it the fourth industrial revolution, where we have AI systems and almost everyone on earth is hooked into the internet, mobile phone, some form of online banking. We now have the forefront of an at, at the tipping point of an entire other possible industrial revolution. Now they're not waiting for it to happen organically, like the combustible engine slowly took over industry. They're going to force it upon us in ways we don't want. Um, these two characters are part of what's called the Young Global Leaders Program made, put forth by the WEF, the World Economic Forum. Now there's a whole host, including Angela Merkel in Germany, Emmanuel Macron, who are graduates of Klaus Schwab's Young Global Leaders Program. Now, I don't know how deep the rabbit hole goes. It doesn't really matter. What I do know is the way, when everyone's using the same token language, like build back better, time for a great reset, etc. And when every action they make from their pulpits of governance is in the same direction, I don't have to have a backroom cult, back cult going on somewhere. I know that they have a shared ideology. And a shared ideology and a shared strategy, which means they're on board ideologically and they're going to move forward with it. So really what you're seeing when you look at the three resets we just talked about is the inevitable climb into the seat of godhood by mankind when we do reject something like the natural order, where God's at the top, we have a theistic political theory, which, let's be honest, that's how the West was built. Athens meets Jerusalem, creates the Western world, based on the notion that, and it says right in our Charter of Rights, which we're celebrating the 40th anniversary of this week, the supremacy of God is the philosophical underpinning of our charter. Why would that be required? If there is no God, there is no order or design to our cosmos, and there is no set law of human governance. And humanity isn't, like an anthill, is not structured by a superintelligence, okay? Which therefore, if it's let run on its own, will work out the will and the intelligence of the creator. Theistic political theory is the reason why the West is unique, and is the reason it's the number one immigration destination on earth and the wealthiest, freest, most advanced society in the history of the world. Like I said, if a pharmaceutical company comes up with a chemical that cures cancer, that's a real world result. Now I know they've tuned into real chemical laws and they are to be emulated. The same as goes for the West and its governing principles of natural laws of governance. Freedom of speech, freedom of movement, free markets, economies, um, private property, etc. These are natural laws we've discovered and gotten real world results with. What you're seeing now is the complete turning on its head of that entire principle and putting forward essentially the man is God society. And the question is, what's that going to look like? Is that something we want or is that something we need to fight against? I'm going to open up to question and answer so we are done with the lecture portion. You guys were very well behaved, by the way. I know that was, that was tough. <laughs> to keep it organized, I'm gonna, if you don't have the conch, you can't talk. Uh, I just need, my Vanna White isn't actually here today. Here, she, she, you'll do just fine. So if you have a, an ans a question, put your hand up and Christian will gladly give you the mic. Now just so you know, we're going to make this a weekly occurrence. For example, next week, Cam will be here at 6.30, and he'll be doing a talk as well. We're going to try and be here, and I'm going to be here the following Saturday. So we're going to try to make this. Our whole goal, by the way, is to get people such as yourselves who are maybe already know this, or maybe you don't, either you're here for your own education, or you want somewhere that's not embarrassing to bring someone who's on the verge of awakening to all this. So that's the whole reason for this. And thank you for coming, by the way. Um, thank you. That was really before I ask my question, I just want to say I'm glad that God is still in charge. Yes. Um, my question is, why is cryptocurrency hardback? Like, I don't get that. 
because I know that some people are recommending it as an investment, and I don't understand what's right. behind it. Yeah. I barely understand it. The only reason I trust it is, uh, and I wish my little, my little brother is supposedly watching this live stream. He's probably screaming at his computer right now of what he would like to tell you. Uh, maybe he can call me if he, <laughs> right now and I could just put the mic up. I don't understand it much more than the fact that it's essentially a coding language that, it, it, think of it this way. If you wanted to, what's a very popular YouTube or video that's gone on, that's gone viral, right? Think of an extremely, people have downloaded onto their hard drives, people have hosted on different servers and YouTube, Rumble, ev everything else. Could you ever fully erase that piece of coding for that video? It'd be very difficult, if not impossible. It's even more secure than that. In the sense that, now again, I'm not advising anybody to make any, I'm not an investment advisor. I've invested in crypto and precious metals, things that are, I think safe, but the best I can do, unfortunately, is that analogy. It's so embedded, it's hosted, the code for the currency is hosted on so many computers, and there are so many computers in existence that are online today, that it's essentially harder to destroy. I could destroy gold if I got a hold of it. No one on earth has ever been able to destroy a blockchain, a piece of blockchain. It's considered unbreakable. Can you buy anything with cryptocurrency? You, it's starting to become something that mainly right now as people are, it's gaining value then it's being resold, right? But for example, there's a Bitcoin ATM on the corner of uh, Cook and Fairfield, right? Countries are starting to use it as a reserve currency. Uh, people are starting to buy high level things with crypto, but there's a select few, I think less than 2% of the population has any. So the problem right now is as solid as it is, it's not adopted on a wide enough degree to be convenient. So if the more people that purchased it, would that make it more difficult for the governments to introduce their digital currency? 100%. And it's un, it, there's 20 million, 21 million, is it Bitcoin or, yeah, okay, I'm getting the, the, the Zoomers in the back are giving me the, the nod. There's 21 million Bitcoins in existence. Now, many of them have been lost. You've heard of stories where guys, Early adopters have a, had a laptop with like 100 Bitcoin on it, which is now worth whatever, you know, a million bucks. And they've, but they remember throwing that laptop away when it stopped working and they're like freaking out. Now one guy I think had $700 million worth of Bitcoin on a laptop that he'd thrown away because he'd bought a whole bunch really early on. So you cannot make anymore, it's only being lost. Here's what happens with crypto. They've had to subdivide Bitcoin into what's called Satoshis. And I think it's 250,000 Satoshis per Bitcoin. 100 million Satoshis per Bitcoin. Okay, so it's become so valuable in the last 10 years that instead of inflating, it has deflated. So now if you had one Bitcoin that you bought for 10 bucks in 2009, it's worth $70,000, right? And in order to use it, they have to subdivide it into smaller and smaller increments. The exact opposite of paying a billion dollars Bolivars for a cup of coffee in Venezuela. Do you see the difference? It's, in, it's deflating as it gets more valuable and more people want in on it. It's kind of like real estate. It's the best I could do. I'm not a huge crypto nerd. Yeah, um, yeah, it's not what those clowns do, it's what we don't do. So how can we create our own society, our own free society, that these clowns cannot interfere. And of course, once we do that, people are gonna join us. Cam's gonna answer that next week. <laughs> That's on you, Cam. But I mean, honestly, like, this is a beginning where more and more people that are awakening are coming together and getting clarity as to exactly what the game is, what the mechanism of the enemy is, and trying to create a parallel economy, like crypto, is, is one of our moves. But being aware enough and enough people awakening that at the very least we don't keep going further and faster down this rabbit hole where we keep re-electing the politicians that have had this in mind the whole time. I mean, if you can, grow your own food, right? Opt out of the system. I don't have a very, what's that? Yeah, homeschooling is a huge revolutionary move, by the way. Because now you've got a completely countercultural, and we, most homeschoolers outbreed your typical non-homeschooler. Typically, uh, homeschoolers have conservative values. We outbreed them. So it's, it, we're in a generational war here. It's not gonna, we're not gonna snap out of this. 
we got to aim for one or two generations down the road. What is the link to the live stream so we can watch them if we're not able to come? Yes, back? very. Um, unfortunately, my YouTube channel has about 10 digits at the end of it. I can't give it to you as I, but if you go to YouTube and search Christians Podcasting, you'll see that logo come up, and that's where everything is stored. And if I can say, um, we'll have a contact list at the back, so if anybody wants to put their name on there, we can keep in touch with you, and we're going to do this each Saturday. Yeah. And uh, w if there's changes, we can keep in connection there and through the summer, that kind of thing, right? So please, it's over on the far back in the foyer where the snacks and coffee are afterwards. Oops. I got my eye on you. You'll get your chance. Don't worry. <laughs> So in order to de defeat a controlled market, um, could, you, could you just barter with other people and have your own economy? Like if they set up their own like thing, like, oh, you have to buy our current Canadian currency, but everyone here just bartered, we'd have our own economy, yep. correct? Yep. So that would defeat, like. It would help. Okay. You still have the double coincidence sure. problem. And do you know any examples of that happening before? Like, did that happen with the Great Leap Forward? Like, were there people bartering or? Oh no? yeah, and in every in every for example, in my brother-in-law went to Russia before the falling of the uh, the the Berlin Wall, before the collapse of the Soviet Empire in the early mid '80s. My brother-in-law went to Russia, and he said everyone's on the black market. Like you can put somebody in, an, in a socialist system, but you can't take the capitalist out of the human heart. It is natural human behavior. So they're sitting there, they have their job, that's, they got their stipend for managing the grocery store, which they don't manage because they get paid whether they manage it or not. And they're busy working that black market. So yeah, it always happens. Um, Chris, there's a young lady up here that had a question. Where is that? Right there. Yeah, um, I'm sort of guessing that maybe this is going to be a topic for another session because I don't think you could answer this in 30 seconds, but I'm very interested in hearing more about um, what left-wing politicians are talking about, universal basic income, and the other thing is the social credit system, which I find pretty scary. Mm -hmm. And you're going to be talking about that another time, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think Cam's going to cover some of that next week because universal basic income, again, there's no money for that. So what are they going to do to give everybody? What did they do for CERB during the pandemic? They printed money like they had never printed before. I think 40% of every U U.S. dollar that's ever existed was printed in one year. They increased the cash supply of the U.S. 100-year-plus history of the dollar in one year by 40%. Yep, 100%. Your, your, your pensions are unsecured liabilities, right? They're based on absolutely nothing. Unfunded. Yep, unfunded liability. Where's my Vanna White? Okay, yes. So um, the, um, h have you heard of, um, what's this, Agenda 21, mm -hmm. which is the precursor of Agenda, Agenda to, uh, 2030, yep. which became the Great Reset. Yep. So um, I'm not here to talk about money itself, but about the the whole system. So in Agenda 20, in, in 2012, I, w I watched uh, Rosa Coiri um, giving a presentation about um, Agenda 21. At the time, it was called Agenda 21. And she said that um, all the countries, um, in, in each country, there's uh, going... Um, we will all be herded into um, with this urban centers, and the uh, and we'll be living in like tenement houses and stack houses and stuff like that. We won't own anything, and um, and um, and then the rest of the country will be considered uh, a wilderness corridor, um, and where no one can enter. And then all the farm uh, f farmhouses and single family dwellings will be taken away from them because no, no one's going to own anything and they'll all be they'll all be herded there. So she talked about this and a, a lot of other stuff about it at length. Now, when the Great Reset was announced, I knew it was the 
precursor of that. And before she died, she did say that that that, that was it. Um, but um, and that was planned since 19, 1970s. So um, my question is. Um, I, I hadn't heard people from the Great Reset, like Schwab and the others, mentioning that this was the plan. Do you know if, there, if that's the plan that, th that they have with the cities and the countries? Um, I don't think they've made that specific of a, of a point, but they have said we will own nothing. So it sounds very fit, fit. If you own nothing, you're living in subsidized housing. And you're renting your home, which means you better behave, or else they can pull you from the home. Maybe just send some of us out to the wilderness corridor to. Hi. Um, I guess what I'm wondering is, uh, as far as what we should be focused on, um, is it creating an alternative financial system, or is it trying to stop them from doing what they're about to do? Or I'd say both. Doing both. Yeah, both. I mean, what can you do? I'm still, in many ways, formulating my plan. I mean, we homeschool our kids. Um, we're diversifying. You know, I'm, I'm trying to get rid of my liquid cash, right? Um, we're, trying to, we're thinking of getting property where you can just grow our food without needing to be on the grid. Not everybody can afford to do that. Mm -hmm. So, and in the meantime, I mean, one of the tools that I, we have to educate ourselves. Yeah. The reason we're doing this every Saturday is we got to create a system where you guys can come and bring that, like I said today at the rally, there's a third of us that have never been fooled by any of this. There's another third that's Hitler's youth. They will never see the light. They're sheep. Then there's that middle third that is our target. And when, as the, some of those middle third, and we don't need a majority. We just need an energized minority. So we have, the time for silence is over, that's for sure. The time for un avoiding uncomfortable conversations at the dinner table with family or friends is over. Now, obviously, there's a time and place. You can't just keep hammering everybody you meet. But we have to be educated like we are today. I'm hoping most of you now have a much clearer picture that you can now discuss with some of your friends and family and say, listen, do you not notice that this is happening? I mean, just talking to them about currency alone is talking to them about math. You cannot hold the value and the integrity of society when you destroy its currency. Why are they destroying our currency? because they have something waiting in the wings to become the new reserve currency, which they love because it offers them everything their wildest dreams could ever offer them. Total control. Omniscience of what we do. Are we going to have more on cryptocurrency? Are you guys going to do another one on? Well, I'm going to probably farm that one out because I know enough about it that I, I buy it. Uh, I may have to have some help from yeah. some Zoomer nerds that I know. Uh, <laughs> that are sitting in the back. And if I can just say uh, on that, if we get each of your emails and you can share the, the links in the podcast to another 10 or 20, otherwise if we don't share this information, it's, it has no purpose. Right. It just dies and it has no, no, uh, no, nothing moving forward. So. I, I have just a question. I'm not sure if you'll ever be able to cover this or not, but uh, for people who have saved like for their pensions and things, their own money, they have control to either Bitcoin or precious metals. But people also relying, for example, on like a Canada pension or yeah. security. Some people have disability things. Do, do you have any information if, if they're going to like take that all away and replace it with a uh, universal income and then possibly cut people off? Yeah, what they're going to do is they're going to, and this is why they have a high chance of success. They're going to come to the millennial class, like I talked about, who have no chance of paying their student loans back. They're broke before they even got out of the gate, and the hypersensitive fixed income crowd, the retirees that are depending on their pension. And they're gonna say, hey, guess what? Sorry, dollar is going to fail. If you adopt this digital currency early, we'll convert you, and they're already talking about this, we'll give you a 10% increase. It'll be one, it won't be one to one. You'll get one point, dollar and 10 cents per dollar if you switch now. And if you don't, what you have going on here is going to fail you. So they are going to be eager to adopt whatever it takes to keep them afloat when they're too old to work, right? And the, er, the younger crowds are like, hey, I can, I can get my debts wiped out and I can get more money for my money. Let's do it. I got nothing to lose. 
So they're going to uh, use that as tools. Those two sensitive demographics are going to be a, a touchstone moment for them uh, to try and get everybody on this new system. What can people possibly do about it in advance? Yeah, diversify your investments. Hope if more and more of us get on something like a parallel economy, Bitcoin probably is the most viable one right now. Then we've got, let's say 10% of the population was on Bitcoin, willing to trade in your office. Like, I'm going to start, actually, my brother's got me uh, putting the mechanism forward of being able to have a crypto-based crypt, payment system for my clinic. If more and more businesses latch onto the crypto market, it'll, do, it'll sell itself. Because now you've got money that's not going to, it's going to deflate, not inflate. And you can now use it. And if you can start using it in 10% of the interactions you have, and you realize it's safer than the dollar, and it's creating a competitive free market of money system that depowers the, the system, the, the currency switch would be our single most effective strategy. But people don't understand crypto. I get it. It took me five years to understand it enough after my brother kept preaching at it, preaching at it, sending me books and links, and I started to get it. And mainly, honestly, I saw its value go like this. And I'm like, okay, well, that's, my money's, money in the bank is melting ice cube. You want to put that money in the freezer, which is gold and silver, or put it somewhere where someone's adding water to it in the freezer, which is something like a crypto. Crypto's got a better return right now than any mutual fund, government bonds, or anything else. The only thing better is real estate. But what is the millennial going to do when they don't have real estate money, right? And I mean, heck, if, if I sold up right now, I couldn't even buy back into my own neighborhood, right? No one's got real estate money anymore. Most people don't, right? Correct. Yeah, correct. All right. There's somebody uh, over I'm here, Christian. Oh, sorry, there's yeah. one? Yeah. Sorry, one second. Just really quickly touching on the Bitcoin uh, thing. So even now without businesses allowing to pay for services with Bitcoin or Ethereum or whatever, uh, there are platforms that you can buy Bitcoin, hold Bitcoin and sell it straight to your Visa card. Like I have one and you can do it within 30 seconds, sell as much as you want into fiat currency directly onto your credit card and use it as liked fiat money on in everyday applications. Yep. Um, so that is available now before adoption, and doing this sort of thing will help with adoption. 100%. Yep. Yep. Any question here? Um, you mentioned private property as, as being one of the foundations of Western civilization, and I agree with you. Uh, but what, what I hear you saying is that governments, uh, in a matter of a very short period of time are going to say, uh, you know, leave your private property behind. Many of us, you know, are not just the seniors here, but many of us, our, our major assets are in our private property, right. whether it's a home or whatever. Um, there's a trust factor here that, that uh, you know, basically they're saying, okay, this is what I, my, my understanding yep. of what you've been saying. Uh, we will give you this benefit or whatever if you do this now. Uh, I can see a huge portion of the population saying, screw you, we're not interested. Yep. So what well, happens will at that be. point? And the, the transfer of the loss of private property won't come from people willingly giving it over. Yeah. It'll be for people unable to keep a property. Right, most people are leveraged, mortgaged to the, to the hilt. Yeah. Not everyone, few people outright own their homes. And private property tax, property taxes will keep going up, plus r interest rates. It will be an involuntary transfer, oh. right, is what I foresee, because of the crashing economy. Right, okay. So yeah, if you own your house outright, never give it up. And no, nobody will. But when you have no choice, right, if you have no chance of getting on the market anyways, and you're racked in debt, and they offer to take that away from you, 99% yeah. of them will take it, and I don't blame them. Yeah. And then if people are scrambling, and I've got to cold my house, and I, oh my gosh, and everything goes screwy, they lose their home just from the economics. Yeah. 
That's how they're going to wipe out private property, as far as I can tell. Oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> well, you could, but then where do you live? Well, that, that would be a last-ditch mechanism, sure, right? All right, depending on how much percentage of your home you still own, right? I'm going to pass the mic over to Bruce, and he yes. is one of the people that will be teaching here uh, on some of the Saturdays. Thank you, Bruce. First of all, Emmanuel, thank you for what you've been presenting. Yeah. It's been excellent. Thank you. First of all, I'll make a few comments. I want to be able to say, first of all, conspiracy infers secret. If you look at the World Health Organization, uh, they just had a summit. There's 100 plus nations that are agreeing to give over our medical systems from various nations. The agreement is there. They're just crafting the words that they're going to use for it. If you listen to, there's 110 workshops with 4,000 people that were just at the World uh, Government Summit in Dubai. If you look at the website of the World Economic Forum, they're all giddy with excitement with what they're gonna do. So this isn't anything about hidden. They're very clear and they're very plain and they're very excited about what they're doing. But several organizations that I'm seeing in different parts of the world, the Institute for National Transformation in nine countries in Africa, they're in Atlanta, Georgia, and they're in London in the UK, they've been preparing in advance for years for what they call a kingdom alternative for agriculture, for economy, for a medical system. So they're identifying that we need systems that we are creating in, in the similar way that Joseph did during the time of Egypt. And my heart is, yes, we need wisdom of what we are going to personally do, but I want to be able to also identify that many of these plans have been, like the Frankfurt School has been since the 1920s. It's infiltrated our education system. The greatest battle I believe that we have is an ideological battle that we are facing that these ideas of whether it's Marxism, National Socialism, they're conceived in the halls of universities. They're propagated and they're disseminated. And so we need to be able to be aware of that dynamic, but I'll also, I'll just briefly tell you a story and then I want some comments from Emmanuel. But in 1976, the Christian Association of Nigeria was formed in Nigeria. And they had a vision that they wanted peace with the government so they could get people saved going to heaven. And so they just wanted the freedom to be able to do that. But in 1989, the Organization for Islamic Cooperation got together and their mission and vision was to turn all of Africa into Muslims. But they started with the education system and the media first of all. Now, in Uganda, we have about 90 million Christians, 90 million Muslims, and 26 million people that don't identify as either. But what they did, the Muslims did, they had a vision to start an education, then in media, eventually to overtake government, all spheres of influence, which are the mind molders of the values and the beliefs of the people in the context of a culture, and by 2019, they've achieved their objectives. They have, their pr the president is a Muslim. They're in charge of all of the federal government. They're in charge of the education system, the, eco the economy, the military, and the judicial system. Well, as this has progressively begun to happen, it's one of the top five most dangerous places in the world to live as a Christian. There's been uh, over 100,000 Christians already killed. 2,000 churches that have been destroyed, and over 5 million Christians that have been displaced. Every single step of the way, what the Christians did is they prayed and they protested. But those that united and organized and strategized won the day. I'm not against prayer and protest. I think we need to do it. But even more than taking care of ourselves individually, I want to win this war. 
And my heart is, I don't want the people in my nation and the nations to go into a captivity in an education system where they are being taught what they can think. In simplicity, I want people to decide what they're going to want, what they want written on their hearts and their minds, and who's writing it. We know that God, he says in Hebrews, that he wants to write his law in our hearts and our minds. But we have to identify others are discipling the nations, and I believe there's got to be a, strategize, a strategizing and organizing, uniting and mobilizing, and that we can turn the tide. Communism identifies we need 5% in unity to rule the populace of the people. Maybe 5%, maybe 10% united, organized, strategizing that we can turn the tide. My heart is to see people coming together and that in the same way these organizations, World Health Organization, World Economic Forum, the World Government Summit, they're collaboratively working together and many others. So, Emmanuel, I want your thoughts on what we can do corporately of awakening more people that we not only awaken them to pray and to protest, but we actually create alternatives for the benefit of others, not just ourselves, but in agriculture, in economy, in energy, in every single area to benefit mankind, because without it, People are going to be forced to comply and conform. Uh, and I don't know if even what we're doing individually is going to protect us from what's going on unless we are united and organized. Anyway, I have much more to say and many more questions, but could you just respond to the comments what and a, to what the a, questions what a nasty that were in trick, there? What a nasty trick to put that as the last question. <laughs> That's a four-week series that we're going to have to... It's more than four weeks. Oh, yeah. Yes. I'll, I'll just say this, and then we're going to break for snacks. Um, we have to do something. We have to do something. And again, the era of just living in North America as peaceful Christians is over. I'm sorry. There's people who want to completely radically change the lives our children will live compared to ours. We have to do something. And these series will be our best attempt at coming up with the, a thought culture, that you guys can participate in, but hopefully I've given you enough to start your own search for alternative routes and uh, hope to see you guys. Uh, and we can mingle and you can, we can, I'll be out here to answer questions. So thank you and hope to see you next week.